All right, Isaiah chapter number five. Um, I have a couple of different series that the Lord has uh, put on my heart and given to me, waiting to finish up with what we were doing in Leviticus and with all of those different messages, 14 or 15 messages that we did on some things that you must do. And since uh, the Lord has brought both of those to a conclusion, I've got a couple of different series the Lord's put on my heart to start eventually. But until then, I've, I've, there's a lot of standalone messages that while we were preaching those series, the Lord had been giving me and feeding me and putting on my heart. And so I want to try and preach some of those standalone messages as we have been doing on Sundays and Sunday nights and Thursday nights. And uh, this is one of those the Lord's put on my heart now for some months and just haven't had time or opportunity to preach it. But I believe we will tonight. Isaiah chapter number 5. I'd like to read the first seven verses of the chapter. If you found your place with me, say amen. amen. Isaiah said, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Notice verse number four. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. The interpretation of the first six verses are found in verse number seven. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The man, the one who planted the vineyard, who has worked in the vineyard, who had blessed the vineyard is the Lord himself. The vineyard is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. Isaiah chapter 5, in these first seven verses of this chapter, must be one of the saddest and most heartbreaking commentaries of God towards his people that you find in the Scripture. God is speaking through Isaiah the prophet about his vineyard, which is the nation of Israel. More specifically, the people of Israel. The Lord had plowed. The Lord had prepared. We find all of that in the text. He had planted. He had planned on fruit. And then by the time it gets down to the end, after all of the work and all of the labor that God had put in on these people, all of God going out of his way to call Abraham out of earth, of the Chaldees to bless Isaac and bring even Isaac forth out of an old man Abraham and an old woman Sarah then to bless his life to bless Jacob the conniver and the cheater and the trickster's life and then God to bless Joseph's life and then God to bring him out of Egypt bring him into the promised land and all those things that God did after God had done thing after thing and God had made preparation after preparation done so much good in their life God God looked for some fruit to come out of them. God looked for something valuable out of their life that would bring him glory, that would bring him praise, that would bring him honor. He deserved the honor after all of the labor that he had put into them. But when the Lord looks in these seven verses, the Bible tells us that he sees nothing produced of value, nothing that he would term as this is what I'm looking for, this is what I wanted. Instead, the Bible said that it just brought forth some wild grapes. It didn't bring forth forth what he was intending for it to bring forth. Now, we understand the vineyard and the garden of God in the Old Testament is Israel. God works in and through the nation of Israel. Most of that Old Testament is centered around the nation of Israel and the people of the Jew and God sending preachers their way and prophets their way and teachers their way to try and keep them in fellowship with him and bring them back when they're out of fellowship. But you and I understand now 
on this side of the cross in an empty tomb, that God has put Israel on a shelf, that God has wrote a bill of divorcement to Israel and put her away according to Isaiah 50 and Jeremiah chapter 3. We understand that Paul continually kept trying to go to the Jews and preach the gospel. And they kept rejecting that gospel. And by the time you reach the end of Acts chapter 28, we find that God has put Israel on the shelf. And God's focus now is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body of Christ made up of Jew and Gentile. We spoke just a little bit about this in Men's Bible Institute, but I don't want you to be confused. The church has not replaced Israel. Israel has still got a plan. God's still has a plan for Israel in the future, but not during the church age of grace. At this time, Israel is an enemy of the gospel. They are an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are estranged from Jehovah. And right now, the garden God works in, right now, the vineyard that God works in, that God prunes and God plans in, and God plants in, and God wants productivity in, is the church where you're at tonight is the church of the living God. There is nothing more important to God on the face of this planet right now in 2024 than the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. I know we got an election coming up, but that ain't the most important thing in God's mind right now in August of 2024. It ain't Trump. It ain't Kamala. That's the most important thing to God. You say, what's the most important thing to God right now? What's going on at Bible Missionary Baptist Church on Thursday night? God is interested in the redeemed. God is interested in the blood bomb. And God is interested in you and I bringing forth fruit to some value because he has invested in us. And I want you to notice what the Lord said about this vineyard, about this garden in verse number 4. These are tragic words. The Lord looks at this garden that he had invested so much in. And he says in verse 4, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? He said, what more could I do? What more do you want? What more could I have given you for you to be successful? And the answer is nothing. God had done everything that was needed for them to bring forth fruit, but nothing was produced of value. I want to preach tonight for a few minutes on this thought. I believe this is what the Lord is saying. Preaching on this thought, I've done all that I can do. I've done all that I can do. The Lord finally gets to the place, Brother Randy, he looks at these people, he looks at this figure, and he says, you know what, there's... I can't do anything more than what I've done. Like the old song, How Firm a Foundation, used to say, What more can be said than to you he has said tonight. This is a vineyard, listen to me at the onset of the message, this is a vineyard that has failed to do what God planted it to do. I mean, I don't think there's anything more tragic than a church or a Christian to fail in doing what God has saved it to do. I mean, we soak up the good grace of God We soak up the blessings of God and then we in return produce nothing for all the work that God has put into our life for. This is a vineyard that has failed to do what God designed it to do. Now y'all listen to me about failure. Failure in the life of a Christian, failure is for real. Everybody fails from time to time. There's not one of us that can ever say, I've never failed the Lord. We just preached on that here a while back about he's never failed me. But I can't say that back towards him. There's been times I have failed the Lord. Failure is for real. There's going to be times you're not going to produce as much fruit as God wants you to or you wish you would. And you're going to say, man, I just failed the Lord in that. Hey, everybody does. When you do, hit an altar and get right with God. So failure is for real. But listen to me as well. Failure doesn't have to be final. You sit here tonight and you say, man, I failed the Lord. Ain't no sense in even going back to church. Ain't no sense in going to not. That's not that's not what God wants failure doesn't have to be final you can get up you can get right and you can go on for God there's a place of reinstatement there's a place of revival there's a place of refreshing there's a place of re-enlistment just get right with God but listen to me tonight this is why I was saying this about failure don't miss this this has been in my heart now for a long time I want you to hear this if you don't hear nothing else in the message not only is failure for real and failure don't have to be final but you hear what I'm about to say fail 
failure in my life or your life is not God's fault. I have just about had it up to here with Christians blaming everything God on their failure. All of a sudden, some Christian gets out of church. Some young person finally hits 18, 19, 20 and runs out from a good church and runs out and lives for the devil. And immediately, some crazy, dumb Christian in the church starts pointing at the church and saying, well, it was our fault. We didn't this and it's their fault. No, 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 no. Failure is not the church's fault. It ain't God's fault. It's our fault tonight. God has given us everything we need to be successful. And if you fail or I fail, stop pointing the finger at everybody else. God says, what more could I have done? I mean, look here. Everybody, nobody wants to take responsibility, Brother Mark, for their own failures anymore. We live in that generation that everything is somebody else's fault. Every problem, every failure, it is always somebody else's fault. I'm telling you, it ain't God's fault if you don't succeed in the Christian life tonight. It won't be this church's fault if you don't succeed in the Christian life. It won't be because somebody didn't talk to you or there wasn't a program for you to get get involved in or there wasn't a message for you to get right during or there wasn't some Bible teaching for you to hear or there wasn't a song for you to worship to or there wasn't it it won't be the church's fault it'd be your fault y'all get what I'm saying tonight the Lord's done all he can do y'all listen to me Paul could have the apostle Paul I thought about this the other day brother Cope Paul could have failed and got out of church and quit on God you know what he could have done he could have said this I'll tell you why I quit going to church and I'll tell you why I quit serving the Lord and I'll tell you why I got backslid because of the jailer that jailer beat me that jailer cussed at me brother David that jailer was ugly to me but he didn't do that he could have said, Brother Charlie, he could have said, I tell you why I quit on the Lord, why I stopped producing anything of value for God, because of the Jews. Every time I tried to preach to them, they had me locked up. Every time I tried to preach to them, they criticized me. Every time I tried to p- p- cry and preach and pray, they just, just totally hurt my feelings. He didn't say that. He could have said, I'll tell you why I quit, because of Demas. Demas hath forsaken me. Boy, Demas is my good friend. We're Christians together serving God. And Demas let me down. That's why I quit on God. He could have said, I quit serving the Lord. I failed because the churches. Do y'all know what what Paul said in one place about the church at Corinth? He said, I had needs and you didn't supply it. The church at Philippi had to supply it. The church let me down. Quit on God because the church let me down. He didn't say that. He kept on serving. You say, how did he do that? How did he do that? Listen to me. I can't control what others may do, but I can control how what others do affects me. I can't control what none of y'all do, but I can't control what y'all, how what y'all do affects my spirit. I can't control what my children may end up doing. I can't control my wife may end up doing, but I can control how it affects my spirit tonight. I'm not going to get to the place where I quit on God and I stop producing anything of value because I'm pointing at everybody else. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's the church's fault. It's them people's fault. It's that person's fault. It's somebody in the pew. It's that God's fault. He done me wrong. Some preacher in the pastor. I, I refuse to let that be my record tonight. God has been too good. The Lord has treated me too right for me to just say that's enough this evening. We always want to blame everybody else. Why our vineyard, our garden, and our life don't produce anything? The truth is, it ain't God's fault. What more could he have done? It's my fault. It's my fault. So if you look at your Christian life, and your Christian life produces nothing of any value for the kingdom of God, mark this down, that ain't God's fault. And I want y'all to understand something. I ain't the greatest preacher in the world, but nobody else can preach a better gospel or a better message than I preach. I'm going to tell you, it ain't going to be this preacher's fault either. 
I try and give you a balanced diet. I try and preach to you topical, try and preach the expositional, try and preach the encouraging, try and preach to you, you know, all the spectrums in between. It won't be because you didn't get preaching. You say, whose fault is it going to be? Yours. Mine. I, I want to show you something about this message preaching on. I've done all I can do. Let me show you about three or four things, and we'll hurry and go tonight. Three or four things we'll hurry and go. Firstly, we see the tools of the vineyard. The tools were given for the vineyard to be successful. Look at the tools of the vineyard. Look at verse number two. The Bible said in verse one that he plants this vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Verse two, he picked out the best ground for it. And watch what he did. There's five things that he does. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst of it. And also he made a wine press therein. Do you notice the tools? God gave all the tools needed, Brother Zach, for this garden to be successful. The Bible says that he fences it. You say, what's that? He fences it. That's protection. That's boundaries. That, that's for the safety of the vineyard. Y'all listen to me tonight, especially all you young people in here, that you're starting to reach that adulthood age, 17, 18, 19 years old. It won't be long you'll live on your own and have your own home and such as that. Listen to me. I know sometimes some of you youngins think, man, what's all these boundaries for? What's all these fences for at the house of God? It's for your safety tonight. It's not to, it's not to keep you from enjoying life. It's to keep you enjoying life so you don't wind up with scars, so you don't wind up with hurt. So li listen to me. I can understand why some Christians don't make it if you go to some church that don't ever put no fences around nothing. Just live free, run crazy, do whatever you want to do. Yeah, I get But we have put some fences in your life. Some people constantly push at the fence and try and kick at the fence. The fence is not there because we hate you. It is there for your protection tonight. We're giving you tools. We're giving you tools. There was a fence. Listen to me. I'm headed somewhere. The tools. He fenced it. The tools. It says in verse 2. He gathered out the stones thereof. What's that? That's getting rid of hindrances. Getting rid of the hard things that is going to hinder the root from taking root downward and bearing fruit upward. It's getting rid of things that's going to mess up, Brother Zeke, the fruit from having the best value that it can tonight. You say, how come y'all preach like you're preaching tonight? How come you preach? It's, it's to give you tools. We're trying to get rid of some rocks out of your life. God's give you the tools. Some of y'all, when you first come in here, you walked up in this church, and your life had so many rocks and stones all over the place, and God brought you in here, and the preacher of the Word of God started washing over you, and the plow started getting sunk deep and you started reading your Bible and you know what God started doing? God started picking up rocks and chunking them out of your life. God started picking up rocks and getting them out. You say what happened? It made you more fruitful in your life. He fenced it. He gets the stones out of it. Look at what he said also. He said he didn't just fence it. He didn't just gather out the stones. Verse 2 said he planted it with the choicest vine, the choicest, is the best vine. God has put the best in us. You say, I don't think God's given me the best preacher. No, you're looking at physical. You're not looking at spiritual. Don't tell me God hasn't given us the best. God's given us the best that he can give us. There ain't no better book than the book we preach. There ain't no better Savior than the Savior we worship. There ain't no better songs than the songs we sing. God has planted something of value in your life, the choice vine. Isn't that what Jesus said? Brother Udi, didn't Jesus said he was the vine? God planted Brother Roger the choice vine in us, the best vine. Jesus Christ and him crucified and planted his word in us. He's given us the best tonight. Talking about tools now, listen to me. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones, the best vine. Then the Bible says this. It said he built a tower in the midst of it. Brother Keith, right in the middle, I, th I thought this was a blessing, said the vineyard was these people. It's the, it's, the, it's the people of Israel. 
I'm using this as a picture of the church. The Bible talks about that the pastor in the church, he's a picture of somebody who works with vines and grapes and things of that nature. So the church is a garden. You see what it said? It put this tower right in the middle. Listen to me. It didn't put the tower, Brother Chad, on the outskirts or in a corner of the vineyard. He built the whole blessed fired vineyard around the tower. What is the tower? What is the tower? You look up towers in the Bible. A tower is a place for observation. To watch for danger. It's, it's to look and survey. To keep things from harming whatever the tower has been placed in. It is also a tower is a place where the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, Brother Heath, and are safe. A tower is a place not just for observation. A tower is a place to run into to find safety in times of danger. You say, what is this tower? I believe it's a picture of the local church in our life. And I'll say this about the local church in our life. Our life, our vineyard, brother, our tower shouldn't be just put on a corner of our life somewhere. And just every once in a while we visit the town. No, the local church should be the epicenter of our life in the right middle of our life. And everything else built around the church of the living God. Why? Why? It's the place of observation for our life. The Bible says, the Bible says that I am to watch for your soul. I ain't trying to stick my nose in your business, but I'll say this. I can't watch for your soul if you make the church a last second priority and don't hardly show up. I, I can't. I, and I was, I'll say this too. Brother, you need the church. You need a place that on a regular basis, several times a week, you can run into the tower and find safety for a few minutes to get the help you need from the world. How many, I just, my heart's full here for just a minute, but how many times, how many times have you just felt like the devil has trailed you near about all week long? I mean, just, it just felt like the hounds of hell barked at your heels all week long and you have fought and fought and fought and about Thursday night, you come sliding into the tower and it was almost like the Lord slammed the door in the devil's face just for a minute and you got to worship and you got to fellowship and you got to hear a message and you got to go to an altar and the Lord gave you what you needed when you slid into that tower. I mean, brother, that's what the church is for. I'm telling I don't know about you, but Sunday morning helped me. You say, preacher, you didn't preach, I know. But just getting in his presence at the tower, it sure did help my heart tonight. What? What more could God do for you? Tools, tools. And then you see what he did after he did all this. Fenced it, gathered the stones out, planted the choices vine, built a tower. Then he made a wine press. What's the point of that? That's expectation. He is expecting something good to come out of what he planted. He that soweth should sow in hope. He that ploweth should plow in hope. God's expecting something, an expectation of this. So what are you talking about, preacher? I'm saying, what more could God do for you? What more could God do for me? And if our life is not producing anything of value for the Lord Jesus Christ, if our church gets to the place where it doesn't produce anything of value, we will not be able to say it was God's fault. He has given us the tools Tools, tools. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Tools. Brother David, too, God's give us all the tools. We can't say that God hasn't given us everything we need to be successful. 
And we almost act like I've watched this so many times in my life and other people's lives. We almost act like we are looking for someone to blame. When I'm, I'm not talking about you having a financial problem. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about spiritual matters. Spiritual matters. I'm not talking about health issues. I'm talking about spiritual matters. Us living a life that produces something godly for Jesus Christ. And we look at others and say, well, it's their fault and it's their fault. Sir. Hey, I want, I want y'all to know something. Even mom and daddies that are good mamas and daddies have children that turn out wrong. I've heard preachers preach before and they almost act like, they almost act like if your kid goes crazy, then it must have been something you done wrong. Not always. I know of a real, real, real good father that has had youngins turn out terrible. You say, who's that, God? <laughs> you ever met any of God's youngins that was bad representation of their father? I'd say that weren't his fault. <laughs> You may be sitting here tonight and you say, Preacher, I, try, I did everything I could do. You probably did. I'm not saying you didn't. You say, whose fault is that? It's on them. It's on them. But we live in a day where the kids will look at the parents and say, they took me to church. Good. They didn't let me have this and that. Good. We are trying to blame off our own wicked heart on everything and everybody else except just looking at ourselves and say, it's my fault. Tools, tools. Man, I'll tell you, we got the best yard crew in the country. I don't care what nobody says. Brother Kent, Brother Keith, Brother Roger, they've been out here the last couple of days. I mean, brother, they've just been working like renting mules. They've cut grass, they've sprayed Roundup, they've weeded and trimmed and cut trees and all kinds of stuff. Brother Beaver knows what that kind of work that is. That work. And, and you know, these guys are old. <laughs> I'm kidding, they ain't neither. They ain't their prime. But I was thinking about this message. I was thinking, what if we pulled up here in the churchyard and the grass was, you know, waist high and everything just in terrible state of disrepair just everywhere. I mean, just, you know, we just totally growed over. Can't even hardly get in the doors or nothing like that. That would be unreasonable. You say, why? Because they've got all the tools. Well, three lawnmowers back there and steal this and blow her that. And, and they use them. You can tell. Look. <laughs> they got all the tools. You all of a sudden walk up and, they, and it just, it, 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 you know, like we're going to look at here in a minute in Proverbs, you know, you just can't even hardly weed through there to get through the door. You'd be like, well, hold on now. I thought we bought all the tools for this job. It wouldn't be the tool's fault. And y'all, that's where we stand in our Christian life a lot of times. It, it's not the tool's fault. God's put the, the tower in the middle of us. God has given us the best. God's been good to us. He's done all he can do. We see not only the tools of the vineyard. Can I show you something else? Not just the tools of the vineyard. We see the taste of the vineyard. The taste of the vineyard. Notice what the taste turned out to be. Look at the very first, last part of verse 2. The very last part of verse 2. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth, here's the taste, wild grapes. Look at the last part of verse 4. The Lord said, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. I, I, let me say something before I move on to talking about these wild grapes. I will say this, listen to me. If what don't miss this, y'all listen to me, brother Xander. If wild grapes got in that garden, mark this down. It didn't come from within the garden. It snuck in outside. This right here didn't come from inside. You say, how do you know that? Cause he fenced it. Cause he threw the stones out. Cause he put the choice vine in. Cause he put a tower of observation. Because he made a wine press. He did what was right, but it got wild. Why? Something came from the outside, inside. I'm going to tell you what will mess up a Christian life, what will mess up a church. It's when we let wild ideas from the world get in. I'm amazed at what kind of ideas church, church and Christians and preachers have that start seeping into their life. I think, where did you get that from? It didn't come from in here. Wild ideas, wild music, wild attitudes, wild apparel of the world. They start creeping into the church. Yeah. 
That's why we preach like this, to try and keep the wild stuff out. I looked up that word wild. Let me move on here real quick, the taste of the, of the vineyard. I looked up the word wild, and it means bitter, sour. See, the real grapes, the real grapes, Brother Keith, they taste sweet. That's that... When, when the, 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 he said uh, it should have brought forth grapes. What he's talking about is that, that grape, when you taste it, man, it's got that sweet taste to it. Not that taste of, man, it wrinkles your nose up. Some, good gracious, something wrong with that. No, it's got a sweet taste. To it. Listen to me tonight. What God produces in the life of the child of God should be sweet. If you got an old sour disposition, if you got no sour personality towards God's people, that didn't come from God. Yeah. Old Brother Lester Roloff used to sing that song, Stay in touch with Jesus, he'll keep you sweet. Amen. The Lord will keep us sweet tonight. I'll say this, if bitterness or sourness has seeped into your heart, trust me, that come from the outside. I feel compelled to mention this tonight and say this. And I don't think it's by accident that I was studying this and, and this had, has been, you know, something that I've heard repeated now multiple times. Three different times I, in my heart, and I would never say who these individuals was, but three separate times in the span of the last month, in the span of the last month, three different times, I've had three different separate individuals come to me and, and look at me, Brother Tyler, and say, I've been battling and dealing with bitterness towards different people. Now, all three of them were, were tears in their eyes and confessing in a way that I want, I'm, 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 I want this right. I don't want this in my heart. All three of them told me, Brother John, it was hindering their ability to worship. Hindering their walk with God. You say, where does that bitterness, where does that come from? It, it's wild. That didn't come from God. How does wild bitterness like that start getting into a person's life? I'm talking about three different people that are all, uh, that are all part of the church. I'm not talking about lost people. And I want you to hear me. I don't want you to hear me. This is a statement that I've made many, many times. I told the one individual that was telling me this. This is a statement that I've made many times, and it's the truth. Listen to me. Please listen to me, church. You, it is not hard to get bitter. It is hard not to get bitter. Listen to me. You say, how do I get bitter? Just don't do nothing. <laughs> just, don't, just don't work on keeping it out. It'll just, it, it'll just it'll slide right in from the outside, right into your heart. Paul tells the church, tells the Hebrews over there, he said, lest there be any root of bitterness, take root in you and spring up, many be defiled. I'll tell you, getting bitter ain't, ain't hard. What's hard is not getting bitter. What's hard is not letting what them people did to you, them people say about you, or some circumstance in life just absolutely infects you to where it makes you sour. It's hard. I'm not talking about these individuals like that they're, they're backslid. I'm talking about, I, I would say this, if three have come and vocalized it to me, there's much, much more in our pews that I know nothing about. Say, preacher, have you ever been bitter? Oh, yeah. I have to work on my own spirit all the time to keep from getting bitter. At what? And not just you say it to us. No, not you. And me, a number of things. Just like you, you work on it too. How, how, how could they have kept from getting these wild grapes in there? Where did this come from? Listen to me. Sometimes it just comes from self. Go with me to Proverbs. Watch your Bible. I got to hurry. I got some text to show you here. I'm going to give you these last couple of points. Proverbs chapter 24. Watch what your Bible said in Proverbs 24. Sometimes it comes because we just are not diligent in our own life. God gives us the tools and then we don't use the tools. Watch what your Bible said. This is a classic story in your Bible. I've preached on it multiple times in, in the last 20 years or so. Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 30. Watch the last five verses of this chapter. Proverbs 24, 30. I went by the field of the slothful. He just didn't do anything. I'm telling you all, serving God and trying to keep your heart rights work. It's not for the lazy man. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. 
Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. You say, preacher, how is it possible to get these wild grapes of bitterness and wild grapes of worldliness and wild grapes of sensuality and sinfulness up in my life? Just get lazy on your walk with God. Stop reading your Bible and stop praying. And when you come to church, just have a blase attitude towards preaching and towards going to the altar. And just it's everybody else and not me. After a while, the stone wall goes down. Thorns creep in and the wild grapes saturate your vineyard. That's on us. Watch what else happens. I, I, I believe this when we start getting slothful and we start slumbering. Paul writes a lot about going to sleep spiritually. You know, Paul says, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light tongue to save people. Watch what happens when we start slumbering. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Look at this. Not only do we end up uh, do we end up getting these wild grapes and this taste, this wild taste in our life from ourselves? But Satan will throw it in there on us. He's looking for an opportunity, y'all. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Watch what Jesus said in Matthew 13. Verse number 24, Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept... Slothful, slumbering. What happens while we sleep? His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Yes, he had done all he could do. From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The devil is in the business of trying to mess up what God's doing tonight. And I don't care if that's in your life or in our church. The devil's in the business of making us forsake our tools and get the wild taste of the world and bitterness in our heart. I've done all I can do, the Lord says. We see the tools of the vineyard. We see the taste of the vineyard. Look at this real quick. We're hurrying to the close. I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying up. I've been preaching about 35 minutes or so. We see the trial of the vineyard. The trial of the vineyard. Look at chapter 5, verse 3. Chapter 5, verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge. There's a trial going on here. Judge, I pray you. What are we judging between? Betwixt me, the Lord God, and my vineyard, his people. The Lord said, let's go on trial. That's what a trial is for. It's to find out the truth. Let's see who's innocent and let's find out who is guilty. Let's get to the truth. Who's at fault when a Christian's life produces wild things? It's not God. The Lord says in verse 3, you judge. You judge. Who's at fault here? You are... He's literally saying this, Brother Skipper, are you literally going to lay blame on me, the God of heaven? <laughs> Who in here would indict God that our failures are God's fault? Who in here would look at God and say, God, it's your fault that this happened, or it's your fault why I did this, and this is all your fault? <laughs> Surely you wouldn't be that crazy. You know what the Lord said over in Micah? It's a classic text in Micah. I think it's chapter 6, somewhere along in there. Uh, Brother Harold Cooper preached on it years ago. I think Brother Zach preached on it some time ago. I'll never forget Brother Harold Cooper sat right here and preached on it at Bible Missionary probably 15 years ago, something like that. And he preached over there. The Bible says, Brother Hunter, the Lord looked at his people and he says, testify against me. It's a, it's a trial. He said, come up on the stand and tell everybody how bad I've been. Testify where I dropped the ball at. Can I say this evening, if we stand Cody Zorn up next to the Lord and we have to say judge betwixt the two who dropped the ball here, I promise you we ain't never going to say nothing bad about the Lord. Brother, he's the faithful and the true witness. That one right there is the Alpha and the Omega. That one right there is the sweet rose of Sharon. And the lily of the valley, that one right there, is that true vine of God. There ain't nothing wrong with that one. I promise you that tonight. The Lord says, testify. 
How are we going to go on trial against God? What has he not given us? He gave us the scriptures, didn't he? Do y'all realize, you know, the Lord said, what more could I have done? What more could I have done in my vineyard that I've not done? What more could he really do for American Christians in 2024? Do y'all realize how blessed we are? I mean, honest to God, what more could he do for us? You have 66 books, the entire canon of scripture, and it's in your language and all y'all can read. What, what more could he do? <laughs> he gave us a beautiful building with air conditioning in the summer. It's 70 degrees back there is what that thing says. And it's probably a little cooler on the ground level because it gets a little hotter up there. So it's probably about 69 degrees down there where you're sitting right now. They're going to get warm in the winter. We're going to have heat. What more could he do for you? You drove here in a car. You didn't have to crawl. You didn't have to walk. You didn't have to go uphill both ways fighting dinosaurs in the snow like your parents told you they went to school. <laughs> what more could he do? You don't have to do anything but come in and sit down and somebody has prepared all week to feed you the word of God. We make it conducive for you. We have an altar. We have a song. We have a song leader. We, what more could be done? <laughs> I mean, I look at my own life and I look at my own shortcomings in my Christian life and I think, man, what more could God do for me? It is like God has taken out all the hindrances and handicaps in my life to get me to serve him. And then I still let him down. <laughs> God has given us his sanctuary. God has put his spirit inside of us to help us. God has given us sermons. God has given us support from the church. God has supplied our every need. It's not God's fault. What more could he do? The trial of the vineyard, the taste of the vineyard, the tools of the vineyard. And the last thing we find is the terror of the vineyard. This is a terrible thing. Watch the terror. The Lord finally says this, after four verses of telling what all he's done, watch verse five, verse five. And now go to, I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I've done so much for it. This is now what I'm going to do to it. I'll take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up. God wouldn't do that to a Christian preacher. I don't know about that. You know what your Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, about a fellow whose life he kept going against what God had tried to do in his life? You know what God finally said about this fellow that wanted to live wicked and, and didn't have any desire to let God produce anything in his life? This is what God finally said through Paul. Paul said this, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Take the hedge away and let the devil in on him. Now, I know we all sit here tonight, and, and, and Brother Kent, we like, you know, I, and, I, and I agree, you know, I, like I was just preaching a second ago, Brother Gary, man, the devil's after me, and, the, and I agree, the devil oppresses us, and the devil fights us, Brother Joe Sign, I, I get that little brown, he does, he does. Yeah. But y'all listen to me. He ain't been really turned loose on your life. You say, how you know that? Because he's sitting right here. That's right. Yes, sir. I believe there's probably some folk in here that can testify they knew what it was like for God to pull the hedge down a little bit and the devil just about just wrecked them. But the Lord's a God of restoration and God can rebuild the fence and get you back right again. But the fact, by the fact you're here and God's doing a work in your life, he ain't yanked the hedge down. But I promise you, the Lord ever yanks the hedge down on your life, you ain't seen nothing yet. You say, what's that look like? Read Job. What's that look like? Read 1 Corinthians. God pulls the hedge on this dude's life and the devil jumps on him both feet. I mean, runs him through the mud, the blood, and the beer. Yeah. Yep. He says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The terror of this thought is you keep doing nothing with what God's given you. You keep doing nothing with the tools God's put in your life. Yeah. You keep just producing the wild taste of the world. The Lord will finally just kick the heads down and say, all right, jump on him. Jump on him. What's the point of that? The point is to get the Christian right. Say, oh, God wouldn't do that. I don't know. Did you ever read 1 Timothy chapter 1? 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 20. Paul said, uh, I, I, there are some that concerning the truth have erred. 
They've got out of the way. They're not doing what's right. He said, what'd you do to them, Paul? 1 Timothy 1.20. He said, of whom is Hymenaeus and, and, and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You say, oh, preacher, the Lord wouldn't ever let that happen to our church. The Lord wouldn't ever let that tear down the wall and mess that mess the church up. Like, I don't know. I don't know if we don't do nothing with the tools God gives us. You know what the Lord told two churches, two churches in the book of the Revelation? Revelation chapter number 2, verse 5. Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord used these words, Brother Steve. These words just haunt me. He says, repent or else. Look them up. It's in both of those texts. He tells one of them, repent or else I'll remove the candlestick. In other words, I'm going to just take your church totally out of the way. You say, that wouldn't happen. I was just sitting with a preacher, me, Brother Jack, and Junior was sitting with an a old preacher. <laughs> Coincidentally, his name's John Collins. Go figure. I was preaching for him Tuesday night. Pastor's a great church up in Elliston, North Carolina, Seneca Baptist Church. And uh, old Brother Collins uh, was a convert of Lee Robertson. I don't know how many of y'all ever heard of Brother Lee Robertson, pastor in an awesome church, uh, Highland Park Baptist Church up in Chattanooga, Tennessee for years. He walked in that church one night on a Wednesday night. He was leaving shipping out to Vietnam either the next day or the next week, one or the other, just a few days he was shipping out to Vietnam in the late 60s. And he walked into that church and old Brother Lee Robertson got up and preached the gospel. He come down the aisle and got born again that night in the 60s Highland Park Baptist Church at that time he said he kept using the words and terminology he said that was in the old building I was in the old building I said I said preacher Collins how many was in the old building he said all oh, the old building said about three or four thousand so what did the new building see now when we're talking about this I'm not talking about like a mega church that's liberal Check out Lee Robertson. I'm talking about old-time, independent, fundamental, King James, hellfire, damnation preacher. Chattanooga, Tennessee, Highland Park Baptist Church. The new building they built, Brother Paul, was over 8,000-seat auditorium. He said, I've been in it many times when they had chairs out. People getting saved everywhere. You know what Highland Park Baptist Church is tonight? It's non-existent. I mean, it doesn't exist. They had this. Highland Park Baptist Church was also the birthplace of a Bible college that Brother Danny Farley and Brother Jack Wood and many other great men of God that I know went to called Tennessee Temple University. Did you go to Tennessee Temple? No. Ma'am? Didn't end up getting there. I thought I remember Miss Jane telling me something about that one time. Tennessee Temple University. Thousands of men trained for the ministry there. Solid, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist college out of that church. You know what it is tonight? It doesn't exist. It's gone. The pastor that came in after Lee Robertson ended up compromising on the, on the King James Bible. They asked the man that was coming in behind Brother Robertson, are you King James only? Will you only use a King James Bible? He said, yeah. Two Sundays later, Brother Zeke, they said he walked to the pulpit with a New American Standard Bible and said, I'll use what I want to use in this pulpit. That church went from here. That preacher said in like two years, they lost 2,500 people. They should have lost all 8,000 when the sucker stood up and said that. Better yet, they should have voted him out. <laughs> I ever walk to the pulpit with a different book and tell y'all, go jump my lake, you ought to throw me in the lake. Say amen right there. That's exactly right. You got my permission. Chunk me, chunk me, chunk me. Yeah. You say, what are you talking about? I'm saying tonight a church that saw thousands saved, a man I just preached for was a product of that. It's gone. Gone. Say, how does that happen? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold of the hands to sleep. The wild grapes coming in from the outside, doing nothing with the tools God gave them, and it's over with. And I don't want the Lord to look at my life or look at our church and say this, I've done all I can do. Help me up here, Esther. I don't want the Lord to look at your life, young person, and get the place where he just says, I've done all I can do for you. What more can I do for you? Look at Bible Missionary Baptist Church and say, I've done all I can do. What else can I do for them folk? I bless them people. What more can I do? I don't want to waste the tools God's given us. I don't want to waste all the blessings. Look around at the blessings God has put in your life. Let's make the most of it. Let's produce something. Let's pass a track out. Let's tell a sinner about Jesus. 
Invite somebody to family friend day. Serve, work, pray, labor, read your Bible, raise your family for God. Young people live a holy life. Watch out for bitterness. It's a silent killer. The Lord said, I've done all I can do. And he has for all of us. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray that you'd use the message that we tried to preach tonight. Lord, I try to do my best to give your people what you put on my heart. Oh, God, help us tonight. Help me tonight. Lord, I'm preaching to myself as much as to anyone in this building. Oh, God, you have fenced around me, put a tower in my life, planted the choicest vine. Lord, you've been so good. Help me to simply turn around and live my life serving you. God, maybe somebody in here tonight's not right with you. Maybe they've run a long ways and their life's been tore up. I pray tonight they'd come to you, run to you. Lord, you'll restore them. You'll receive them. You'll forgive them. Help us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come.